Good afternoon once again from Smith School of Business. My name is Neil Beers. I'll be hosting today's session. I'm joined here by my colleague Shin, uh, who will be handling tech support throughout the day, and also Elspeth Murray, our speaker. We'll be getting to Elspeth in just a moment uh, with a, a great session today on the topic of disrupt or be disrupted, the practice of agile strategic planning. I'm going to cover some of the early housekeeping slides, uh, hopefully to cover off a lot of the questions that people might have on their mind to allow you to, to truly focus on the content. First off, we will be recording today's presentation. Uh, we typically will take the presentation, convert it to a YouTube format so you can stream it on uh, any device imaginable, and we will send that out to you via email to everyone who registered uh, within uh, a couple business days. So probably Monday we'll send this recording out to everybody. Um, and also today I'll be talking about a couple different uh, executive education program options. Feel free to respond to the email that you get with the recording if you're interested in any of those uh, program options that we'll be discussing. Secondly, um, we run webinars uh, here quite frequently on a number of business topics. Uh, these are completely free. Uh, we often have people ask if they're allowed to share the invitations with a colleague. Absolutely. Uh, we welcome anyone here. So if you'd like to share that recording with friends, feel free. But also, uh, anyone can register to receive invitations to upcoming uh, sessions in addition to receiving things like white papers and valuable articles that we're publishing online. Simply visit ssb.ca slash webinars, and that's a, that'll get you to the page where you can enter that email address, and you will hear from us uh, with, our, with our next topic in about a month's time. Thirdly, we will be taking questions throughout the presentation today. Uh, you can find my name on the right-hand side of your event center window. Please feel free to use that uh, or the Q&A panel to ask your question. We will get to the questions at the end of the session. So we've reserved about 10 to 15 minutes of time at the end of the session to, to get to those. And please also feel free to ask them at any point throughout the session um, to avoid the, um, the avalanche of questions that we might get at the end. There are um, over 700 people registered for today. Uh, a special welcome to members of Deloitte's Best Managed Companies Network. They're joining us today from across the country, and I've also seen a number of uh, alumni and friends joining us from both across Canada and around the world. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's session leader, Dr. Elspeth Murray. Um, with, El with Elspeth, it's hard to know where to start. Uh, she's an associate professor and associate dean of MBA and master's programs here at Smith School of Business. She's also director of Queen's Center for Business Venturing and a CIBC faculty fellow in entrepreneurship. She completed her undergraduate studies in mathematics and computer science, as well as her MBA here at Queen's. She also holds a doctorate degree in strategy and management information systems from the University of Western Ontario. Prior to joining Queen's in 1996, she worked in industry for seven years. And after being bitten by the entrepreneurial bug early in her career, she's created and instituted many new venture-related activities here at Smith School of Business. As a complement to her work in the new venture field, Elspeth specializes in strategy and change management, which is exactly where we're headed today. It's almost a collision of those two spaces. She's an active consultant and highly regarded session leader on many of our executive education programs. Of interest to, indiv to many of the individuals joining us today, we have two programs on the topic of strategy that I'd like to highlight. We have a five-day Queen strategy program that we offer here in Kingston a couple times per year, and also we have a new offering called Strategic Planning and Leading Change, which is a two-day program hosted several times per year at our downtown Toronto facility. With that, I would like to pass things across the table to Elspeth. Have a great session. Great. Well, thank you very much, Neil, and uh, welcome to everybody um, from uh, wherever you might be. It's a great pleasure for me to be here and uh, a great opportunity, I hope, for you to sit back, uh, relax, and um, have a bit of fun listening uh, to uh, what I hope will be a very informative talk on two really big items in the world in which we live today, all of the disruption that's going on, and then uh, how does this actually play out and what organizations do in terms of um, what I call strategic planning, and I'm using air quotes for the planning piece. So my uh, plan is to spend about 40 minutes going through some slides, and we'll make sure that we have time for, um, for questions at the end. And uh, as I said, between now and then, sit back, relax, and, uh, and enjoy the ride. I was uh, just teaching this morning on our Masters of Entrepreneurship and Innovation program, 
And uh, so I'm going to start really talking about the whole notion of disruption and what is happening in the world in which we live. And, you know, as I was teaching my class this morning, it reminded me once again that I am hard-pressed to find an industry anywhere, maybe the mining industry, but um, maybe not even that, where there is not serious disruption going on. And, you know, really the title of this first slide is every industry, every company is under siege. So they're the obvious ones we hear about all the time. And uh, I could go down the list here, whether you're a lawyer and your basic work is being, you know, automated by uh, very clever computers or you're in the television space and Apple has announced that they're going full bore into this. Um, but I was um, searching around online last night um, and even looking at the business of mattresses. And uh, there are many companies, Casper is not the only one, Casper.com, where they are fundamentally rewriting the rules of engagement in industries um, by thinking completely differently and uh, capitalizing on any number of big whacking trends to actually find a new sweet spot in a very traditional business. And for those of you who don't know what Casper is, um, buy your mattress online uh, without ever having to go into a physical spot to check it out. If you don't like it, you have 100 days to try it out and then return it. They partner with 1-800-GOT-JUNK to uh, pick up the mattresses and donate them. Uh, if you're not satisfied, just a fascinating business model. So um, if, mattress, if mattresses are, are under siege, then, uh, then so is everybody else. And really my, my point in the upfront part of this, um, is this presentation is to just really talk about where some of the disruption is coming from and, uh, and also how you develop insight and intuition around what this actually means to you in an organization, which is the front end part of good uh, strategic thinking or planning, and then more importantly, what do you do about it? Um, there are lots of trends that are creating this disruption, any number of, uh, any number of them in and of themselves create significant dislocation. Uh, I was just the other day reading uh, something from the McKinsey Global Institute talking about their view of the four really big trends. Uh, and I was reminded again that the Casper.coms uh, of the world are taking advantage of some of these. So very interesting to look at what's happening uh, in terms of urbanization. And really, there's always good news and bad news associated with some of these disruptive forces. And for large incumbent organizations, it's almost always initially bad news. And then uh, an epiphany moment you, hear, you hope where uh, somebody says, hey, wait a minute, you know, this is something that, that we can really capitalize on. But a very interesting statistic um, from this research was um, by 2025, the forecast is that China will be home to more large companies than either the United States or Europe. And half the world's large companies, i.e. those with revenues of more than a billion dollars, will be headquartered in emerging markets. That's a fundamental shift. Um, the other thing that's interesting about urbanization is obviously the, the uh, tremendous flocking of people from rural communities to large cities, which is obviously creating this growth. And one of the other stats that I found fascinating was the secondary city, just about 120 kilometers southeast of Beijing, uh, called Tianjin, um, in 2010. Uh, had a GDP of around 130 billion. That's about the same size uh, as Stockholm. And uh, by 2025, it's predicted to have a GDP equivalent to all of Sweden. Um, so it's interesting to look at uh, not just the big cities we know and love well, either in emerging or developing economies, but maybe the ones that don't hit our radar screen. I need not say anything about technological change except to point out that one of the, the uh, real challenges or opportunities is just the accelerating pace and the perfect storm of so many things that are coming together. So, um, and it's really, it's the speed aspect. Um, and another really interesting stat for me, uh, and this is not all about what's happening in China, but um, China's mobile text and voice messaging service, some of you may know, called WeChat has 300 million users. That's more than the entire adult population of the United States. Uh, so you look at this connectivity 
you look at the fact that since um, the iPhone was launched, there are about 150,000 applications um, in 2009. That was two years after the launch. Now it's um, well over one and a half million and so on and so forth. So technology is a huge disruptive force, just not as one piece, but it's the confluence of a bunch of them. You know, the aging population is, uh, is also fascinating. Um, greater global connections, uh, and those are, are just a few. So most of the organizations um, I run up against these days, I would say, uh, and this is a gross generalization, do a fast pass through some of these trends without a deep dive into what they actually mean. One of the successes of uh, Casper.com is the fact that they have figured out a really easy way to deliver mattresses to people who live in apartments in a downtown urban core. They're tapping into the millennials who think it's kind of cool to order a mattress online, and they figured out uh, how to engineer and deliver a mattress in a box, which was something that was unheard of, sort of the IKEA of, uh, of the 21st century. I could go on and on with a number of uh, significant trends. Um, things like the sharing economy, and you can see uh, some of, uh, you know, very interesting study uh, looking at um, what's happening as of 2013 and 2025. In the world in which I live in part of my time, which is the whole startup world, we have truly entered an era where there is less friction. It is so easy to start a business up these days um, because we can find, you can take payments, you can get money on crowdfunding platforms or through peer-to-peer -peer lending, you can set up an e-commerce backend uh, easily through the Shopify's of the world or Alibaba, you got a credit card um, and a fast internet pipe, you can have server capacity to build your machine learning startup and uh, it's easy to find talent through companies like Upwork which is the uh, logo on the bottom left hand uh, side. So if people aren't um, paranoid about uh, some of this stuff, then there's something uh, seriously amiss. Um, and part of really good, I'm going to flip to sort of the what is strategic planning all about in the first place, part of being really good at the art and science of figuring out how to grow, build, and change your business, which is what strategic planning is all about, is that you have to be able to see what's coming long before it's obvious. So one of the questions to ask, and I always ask uh, companies um, uh, who I'm working with or, or when I'm uh, teaching is, to what extent actually are you paying attention? Where are you gathering information from? Who's looking at that stuff and drawing the logical conclusions? You know, if Apple does this, what is Twitter all about? We're going to talk about the automotive, automotive industry in just a moment which is the next great piece of hardware um, beyond the, uh, the smartphone. Um, but it's really actually taking those initial threads and following them all the way through. So here are just some stats about crowdfunding, which uh, recent stat is that it's a $34 billion industry as of last year. Uh, and this is another um, piece that has uh, really leveled the playing field for, uh, for folks to come in and disrupt industries. So the title of the session is Disrupt or Be Disrupted, and um, just to draw this part to sort of a conclusion, it is easy to be a disruptor at the moment, easier than it has ever been in the history of time. It used to be that money was the scarce resource, it's easier to get that now. It used to be ge geography um, was a huge barrier, that's starting to go away. Um, so just think about the, um, the concept of uh, the advantages, the barriers to entry, the traditional edge that big organizations had, and a lot of those advantages are going by the wayside. Um, so be, be paranoid and be hungry. Um, all of this is creating an environment uh, which cuts to the heart of why strategic planning is so challenging in organizations. And that is that we live in a VUCA environment. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you have uh, heard the acronym before, but great volatility, tremendous uncertainty, um, unbelievably complex supply chains and value chains, um, and a lot of ambiguity um, about uh, what, what things mean. 
And this creates massive challenges for the traditional ways in which organizations have, um, have balanced this inherent tension around keeping the lights on and doors open. That's the left-hand side of this screen. Uh, and how much time and effort and what they actually do to think about creating and building the future. And it's creating a significant shift in organizations away from the vast majority of time spent on lights on, doors open, and efficiency, and more time and resources spent on thinking about um, planning, creating, um, and placing a few bets um, to, uh, to give you some shot at being successful in the future and fundamentally navigating um, through, through this period of, uh, of great uncertainty, et cetera. So just on this point, another question I like to ask people is how much time are you spending, either as an individual or in your organization, on the left-hand side versus the right-hand side? And there's no one answer here, but if you are in a particularly fast-paced industry, and I think this goes without saying, you ought to be spending uh, a lot more time on the right-hand side than if you're um, in a slower-moving industry. However, even the mattress business um, needs to be ensuring that there's enough time and attention organizationally, not to just uh, incrementally change what you do, you know, dropping costs, sales costs out or increasing inventory turns um, if you're one of the major mattress retailers in a, um, in a traditional retail format, it's the wrong conversation. Um, now the, the flip side of this is that people are really busy these days, uh, max to the hilt, flat organizations, you know, running on the proverbial, uh, the hamster on the hamster wheel. So the other takeaway from this is that any process or activity that's going to take a lot of time away from people keeping those lights on and doors open is one that's doomed to fail. And I will come back to that when we talk about the, the speed aspect. So this next slide is just a, a different way of looking at those two sides of what makes organizations successful. You have to be able to plan and execute against the current day job, so the current set of choices you've made about what you do, who you do it for, how you do it, and how you think about making money, um, while you actually allocate resources to think about how you grow, build, change, and transform your business. You're General Motors. You still have to make cars. You know, your entire industry is being disrupted by any number of forces. Um, millennials are not buying cars. Everybody's moving to the city. People aren't buying cars. You've got ride-sharing services. You've got um, all kinds of things. Um, so you can't spend all of your time thinking about how you respond to that. You still have to make money to keep the lights on and doors open. Um, and strategic planning, the old phrase strategic planning, is really on the right-hand side of this. And I even uh, suggest losing the term, and I, I differentiate between the lights on, doors open, and the grow, build, and change activities, because that's what strategic planning is really all about. It's about recognizing when it's time to change. It's about figuring out what it is you have to change, and it's about figuring out how you're actually going to do that. It is above and beyond the day job. Uh, and more and more, especially in this time in which we live, it needs to be done faster. It needs to be done by a different group of people. And it needs to be done in a fundamentally different way. And that's where we're going to borrow um, a piece out of uh, what the software development community learned in 2001, is that the old approach to software development was doomed to fail, and there had to be a better way. And I would argue that the way in which we do strategic planning in many organizations is doomed to fail at the moment as well. All right, so when I'm using this term, and you can see the uh, actual quotes around planning, this is about grow, build, and change. This is not about incremental thinking. This is about the really big moves that materially change your business or your strategy. Fundamentally, redefining the business that you're in you know, Xerox moving away from photocopiers to be a document management company. An automotive car company moving away from the business of cars to the business of transportation. You know, transportation as a service as opposed to anything else. This is about new product lines, new markets, new geographies, 
new money-making propositions, new places to uh, operate in a value chain, um, totally different ways of, of doing things. And this is one another fundamental question for organizations. Many of these supposed grow, build, and change activities are set up um, and by their very nature encourage in incremental thinking. They are not designed for the really big changes. And this is where many organizations are getting blindsided. And the landscape is littered with companies that actually either didn't see it coming, didn't want to see it coming, or lacked the wherewithal internally to actually figure out how to recognize what needed to be changed um, and then um, actually put some resources against really doing something about it. So we could go on and on about changes in strategy, but the Boeing's um, complete reimagining of the airline experience with the Dreamliner, however late it was, the fundamental rethink in their strategy, not to mention the fact um, they manufacture it in a very different way, borrowing uh, something from the automotive industry. You know, you've got Starbucks, another great company that basically created a category and then everybody else caught up, so they're reimagining themselves. You know, Amazon, um, incredible insight to create Amazon Web Services and really unlock the potential for, you know, anyone being able to access um, computing power. You've got Netflix making movies, Google now building phones and just about everything else. Um, and the Googles, the Apples of the world, everybody now piling into the car industry. And as I said, more on that a little bit later. So let's look at the traditional approach. And I've been teaching strategic planning for 20 years now. The traditional approach was like the old software development waterfall approach. You would gather information, you would define the problem, you would define the endpoint, you would do a ton of analysis, you would write it all up, make your choices, and then you would relentlessly execute against that plan and you hope that it works. So any of you who've been in the software industry or been, you know, at the end of a development project that didn't go so well, um, we all know the challenges of trying to define the end state um, with limited information right up front. We all know how things can change really quickly. We all know that it's hard to imagine exactly what you want until you see what's possible. And that is what we can learn from the whole Agile community as it relates to strategic planning. It is not a linear process because the linear process, as you can read in the um, bullet points below each of the bubbles, um, there are numerous challenges in each one of these steps that especially these days create challenges and, and huge risk in this working well. So you can experience problems because you can't possibly know everything right up front. Uh, so that's framing the strategic context. Um, you can get mired in too much analysis um, at the expense of creative insight. Uh, you can uh, have challenges in trying to pull it all together because you simply have a giant hairball of data and information that becomes very challenging to say, navigate your way through and say, okay, aha, this is exactly what it means. Um, you can have a beautiful document when we look at defining direction. Um, that actually has no directionality. There's a detailed plan, but there's no strategy behind it. In other words, there are no choices. And fundamentally, at the very end of this very linear, somewhat lengthy process, um, is it forces it, you into a plan then execute paradigm, and you hope that you get it right, um, because if you didn't, you've lost valuable time, and you gotta go back and, and, uh, and rework it. But one thing that I will come back to is what I would describe as very antiquated resource allocation process. Um, the way budgets work, where money is held, the degree to which um, it's allocated at the wrong time of year. We can talk about people as well. So let's then look at, as we map this approach that doesn't seem to work so well into the world in which we live in, what do we need to do differently to avoid some of those challenges? Um, and I could spend a lot of time on this, but as I think about the, the four um, really important alterations to the way in which this works, one is many more linkages to the outside world and non-industry specific information than we've ever seen before. 
companies and industries get disrupted not for, not by the people they know and love well, but by organizations and people who come in from um, from left field, so to speak. Um, a much more agile-like strategic planning process, and what I will talk about is the need to have much more rapid iteration. Any of you who've read the um, the Lean Startup or books that talk about the MVP, minimally viable product, or the minimally marketed, marketable product, um, will know exactly what I'm talking about here. Um, number three is really how do you encourage, how do you create more insight and intuition rather than looking at reams and reams of analysis? So it's kind of shifting the balance. And a very different approach to resource allocation. So the, um, the much cleaner version of GSD, which is getting stuff done. And I'll look at what some, uh, some of the, the organizations that are at least staying in the game are doing on that front. So first up is really looking at um, some of the fundamentals about um, preparing an organization or at least understanding what you're dealing with. Uh, back to my mattress example, uh, I, uh, maybe it will be the next case study I do, but I am fascinated to try and understand whether the incumbents in that industry actually saw the potential for the Caspers of the world, or whether those companies materialized out of nowhere. Um, in other words, the point of this slide is they weren't prepared, they hadn't contemplated what might happen. And that is really what good being strategic is all about. It is not about trying to react when things happen. It's about proactively trying to manage your context and at a minimum being prepared for something um, that may happen to you. Or the best case scenario is what Clayton Christensen and other economists would call creative destruction that you willingly undertake um, to destroy that which has made you great so that you can actually survive and, and thrive in the future. That's actually what Ginny Rometty is doing at, uh, at IBM at the moment, which is a very tall order, is uh, their fundamental business of selling servers um, dissipated uh, very quickly and almost overnight. So how do you quickly recreate the business? Uh, and place bets on things like Watson and, uh, and Cloud, so on and so forth. So how can you see it coming? Um, very quickly, I'm just going to talk about two front-end tools um, that, uh, that seem to actually work well in organizations to get people's attention. And when I talk about getting people's attention, another critical element that creates drag and noise in, in understanding um, you know, the, the urgency aspect of all of this is that you have huge information asymmetry problems between people who are at the cool face, seeing what's happening, sometimes senior management, if you've got a very dispersed organization, you have bits and, in, bits and pieces of information across the globe, and, uh, and if you have a board, sometimes that is the, uh, the biggest problem, is that certain people get the message um, and others don't. So this is one useful tool um, that we uh, use with organizations, and it really helps people solve the information asymmetry problem, because it forces you to, this is not performance, how well did we do last, last year. This is really looking at two dimensions of how well you are performing today, that's current health, and how well you're positioned for the future. It gives you a structured way of picking a quadrant and understanding how you propel people to start moving. And really, um, as I like to say, this gives you a way to share the stomach acid and the angst around um, trying some new and different things now versus waiting too long. Um, if you are on the right-hand side of this two-by-two, two, you don't have to worry. Very few industries or companies these days are on the right-hand side. The left-hand side is if you're in the orange quadrant, that's the best place to drive a significant change from and really say, hey, we need to uh, grab a hold of the situation and figure out how to, re how, how to recreate ourselves. Um, that's the change while you have time category. That's the best place to drive 
a massive shift in your strategy because you have you have time and you're strong. The worst place, but in some cases the uh, the easier task, at least when people are involved, is when you're in the in the red. Your hair's on fire if you're in the red box. It's easy because everybody gets the message, the board gets the message, your employees get the message because your hair is on fire. But it's often the worst place to change from because you're weak um, and survival is far less uh, less likely. So the takeaway from this slide is think about in your own organization. Where are you? Which quadrant and how would you make the case for that? You know, what indicators do you have that are, are saying today is fine but tomorrow is a challenge? And the indicators of strategic health are the things that we started off chatting about at the beginning of the presentation. Big whacking trends, rate changes in performance, a declining or an increasing position. Um, but a lot of what belongs in this category now are things that have nothing to do with your current business. Um, so, uh, so get creative on that front. Um, another tool that we found useful, and this um, it comes from a great book written by Jim Collins, the author of Good to Great, called How the Mighty Fall. All of this is useful for, um, or the, the most useful aspect of this, is to address the, uh, the potential for hubris and arrogance. And uh, many people have gone up this curve and gone down the cliff. Uh, many people have gone up the curve, realized they were at the precipice, and hauled back. This is the story of Starbucks, actually, uh, when Howard Schultz came back in, took over as the CEO, and before they pitched over the cliff, basically redefined the business. And I think we see that um, in many different um, places. So this in and of itself doesn't tell you anything. It just opens up a discussion about whether or not you are simply doing more of the same. Uh, and uh, moving the headlights, if you're making cars, two inches further apart or taking the lighter out so to drop the cost of manufacturing, you know, two bucks is the wrong conversation. You need to be uh, thinking about something entirely different. And my last point on this is um, part of what works against really coming to grips with what is happening at this point in time, and this is the front end part of being really good at this, this planning, this reimagining piece is the role that conventional thinking plays. So on this slide and on the next one are famous pronouncements over time that proved to be categorically false. Um, and they were said by otherwise smart people who were bound by um, a way of thinking about the rules of engagement in a business or an industry. Um, where that time had passed. And I would add one here, which has got to be, back to my mattress example, um, people will never be able to buy a mattress online because they want to test it out first. Once you dispense with that assumption, um, the world is your oyster. Um, last piece here as we talk about kind of even framing up this whole discussion is you know, if you're in an industry that's being disrupted, what are you up for? Do you, and these are color-coded, um, generally speaking, staying in the red zone where you're tinkering at the edges is not what you want to be discussing, but how wild and crazy do you need to be? You know, are you getting outside your current business but in a, a slightly different but not crazy way? This is autonomous vehicles. Uh, this is some of the new... Um, manufacturing technologies in the car business? Um, or is the discussion that you're having, like GM has done, um, where you're diversifying into ride-sharing services? Earlier this year, I'm sure many of you are aware, with $500 million investment in Lyft, which is second to Uber, um, you know, um, signaling that uh, the business of just making cars is, um, is, uh, is uh, passing, um, passing by. Um, all right, so if we talk about uh, framing and understanding what the task is, as in a very important part of getting what I, I refer to as the social license to even do great planning, um, then what does great planning actually look like? And again, you can see that I've got planning in, uh, in quotes there. So um, this needs to be agile and do this much faster than ever before. 
and not choose just one um, point in the future and, and plan against is because of this VUCA environment. Um, this is one of my uh, all-time favorite articles in the Harvard Business Review. You can see, or I hope you can see, it was written in 1997. Uh, but this is really a couple of finance professors who used real options theory to think about how to do scenario planning in organizations. Um, and we don't have time to actually go through all of this, but the point that I wanted to make is that most companies um, are a category three or four. It's like a category three or four hurricane, a big deal, which means the traditional approach to picking one point in the future and, and marching towards that is, is sheer folly. So um, in category three, uh, you can get away with doing some more traditional scenario planning, but for businesses, and many are in this category now, or chunks of their business, there is so little that you know or can ever know um, that you are operating in an environment like the Googles and the Facebooks now, where doing planning is a completely different uh, activity. So that's what we're going to talk about. So in order to be able, if you buy the argument that rapid um, decision making, doing this quickly will give you advantage, and I will chat about something called an OODA loop in just a moment, what that requires is an ability to actually truly embrace um, the fact that you will never have perfect information. You will have far less perfect information than you ever had before. If we were doing this in the military and Colin Powell was giving this talk, he would say, as soon as you have 60% of the information you'd ideally like to have, you make a decision, you get out of your foxhole, and you start moving. The reality is in organizations, how can you ever know that you have 60%? You can only know that in retrospect. So you need to time limit various parts of the discussion, and you have to figure out what your rapid loop is, um, which brings me uh, to the OODA loop. And as a, uh, a couple of final comments on this, perfection is your enemy these days. And as a colleague of mine who's a, an IT professor said, um, the information you're looking for is just in time, just enough, and just in case. So let's then talk about another uh, page that we can take out of what the military does so well in terms of rapid planning and taking action in very volatile, fast-paced environments where, um, where you don't know exactly what's happening, uh, but you've got to make a decision. And an OODA loop comes from uh, training, I believe it was the U.S. Air Force, where um, life, uh, real life research done on um, pilots who were literally in sort of dog fights in the air. And whether or not you were better to have a very fast decision loop, take action, change direction, whether or not, whether or not speed was what you were shooting for, not literally, or whether or not spending more time in the observe end of uh, part of this cycle was what you wanted to err on the side of. So OODA stands for observe, orient, decide, and act. That's exactly what good strategic planning is all about. What's happening in our world? What does it mean? That's the orient. What are we going to do about it? That's the side. What kind of action are we going to take? And really what I'm trying to depict on this slide and what you would be taught if you were a pilot in the Air Force is that you want to be the one who has the tighter, shorter, better loop in the green because you will win just by virtue of the fact that you are making decisions and trying stuff, gathering information, and going through the loop once again. That is what agile software development is all about. That is what the lean startup is all about. And this is the opportunity in organizations these days which is to think very differently about how they practice the art and science of good strategic planning. So for any software developers we might have out there, this is the 2001 Four Principles for the Agile Manifesto. These are foundational pieces to thinking about how to rejig this activity. Uh, so people over processes and tools. Um, you see this in many organizations now, getting groups of people together. In software development, we would call these scrums. In the vernacular in many organizations, these are growth hacking activities, but it really is groups of people get together, do it quickly, see what you can come up with, 
pop it out there, test it, get feedback. If it's a useless idea, drop it, kill it. If it looks like it has legs, bring it back, refine it, release it again. Um, so you can see the respond rather than follow a plan. I'm going to come back to that because um, what also needs to happen um, in the world of strategy, um, like the world of software development, is you have to have some guardrails around what the whole activity is. So again, you can see working prototypes over excessive documentation and back one more time to the customer collaboration over what they would call rigid contracts. So that's the, uh, the feedback loop. So if we map this into the world of strategic kind of planning for the future, this is what the loop looks like. What's happening in our world is what we're doing working. What does that mean? What are we going to do about it? How do we communicate to people the broad directionality, i.e. we move from making cars to the business of transportation? That provides guardrails. We start to allocate some resources around strategic investments in companies like Lyft and, and Truro. We execute. We gather feedback. You know, is that investment working, yes or no? Um, there's a whole topic of conversation just uh, in and of itself. But the point that I'm trying to make here is that um, the ability for that r rapid OODA loop uh, is critical to navigating through fast-paced, ever-changing environments. Um, and really, it's about just picking a lane, doing something, checking to see if it's working, doing a lot of it. And the guardrails are really things like um, stating, we are now in the business of. So if we look at the automotive sector, and again, I would encourage you to start to pay attention to what the big tech firms are doing on this front, how the BMWs and the GMs and the Fords of the world are starting to respond. Um, but one of the, um, you know, the light bulb intuition epiphany moments here is a combination of corporate wherewithal of, of redefining uh, what the business is, but also picking off and connecting the dots around things like millennials are not buying cars. People are not getting their driver's licenses anymore. We've got the sharing economy. We've got urbanization. So you could imagine in one of these companies, someone says, hey, car sharing seems to be a trend. Okay, what are we going to do? Well, we need to invest in a car sharing company and research this urbanization thing. Okay, wow, is that investment paying off? Yes, it is. Millennials are legitimately living in downtown condos, so this car sharing thing is really big. So let's plow more money into Lyft as an example. Um, and oh, by the way, this is another really cool thing that uh, uh, GM is doing is basically partnering with condo developers and creating a zip car service as part of um, uh, what you sign on for to be a condo uh, dweller. So you don't even have to buy a car anymore. You don't have to pay extra for parking. Just use the car when you need it, and it comes as a perk of, uh, of being in a condo. All right, so what does this mean in practical terms? Um, ongoing discussions, rapid feedback loops, um, but really planting, um, uh, making a series of bets and experiments all done within these guardrails, and that was what that big arrow was supposed to depict. And this provides a whole new um, set of opportunities for strategists everywhere in the organization to participate. Um, because really this planning activity is all about better developing insight and intuition. And, and how do you do that? Uh, you need everybody to literally be plugged in. So back to the class that I was teaching this morning, um, my comment was, first of all, you need to dispense with what you thought you knew about how the business actually worked. Um, you want to look at how disruption happens in a service business, look at the legal profession. Um, look at what's happened, how the economics have changed, how the, how, um, the um, products have been broken into small pieces, who's picking off what, consulting is another good one. There's just a, a ton of good stuff out there uh, so that you can make room for some of the new possibilities. And uh, if you look at what some of these really great companies are doing to navigate through, um, they are back to rapid iteration and market feedback and being connected to customers. Uh, lots of opportunities to be out there. Lots of customer connection sites. Lots of work groups 
actually out there in the market. Um, being plugged into these tremendous, um, you know, connectors in terms of open innovation. So you look at companies like Procter and Gamble and the Nine Stigmas of the world. Um, I mean, it's academia, it's um, past employees, it's customers, it's suppliers, um, you name it. Um, and we have seen a tremendous rise in um, something for, if any of the, um, you folks are engineers, you know, back to some fundamental design thinking principles. And this topic is hot. Um, it, it's uh, so useful because it forces you to actually go back to the problems that you're solving and, and uncover new ways of developing empathy um, with your customers. Um, you know, I hate buying mattresses. I don't want to go to the store. I don't want to spend, you know, five hours on a weekend traveling around, checking them out only to get home, have ordered it and figure out that, that the time actually didn't make any difference. I need much more time to actually figure out whether the mattress that I bought was comfortable or not. So that's where a lot of that's coming from. Um, and again, this is just a recent uh, Globe and Mail article, uh, and Ted Graham, who's the author of this, is actually one of our MBA grads who is now the head of innovation for GM Canada. Uh, so yet another reason for, uh, for me being really interested in the topic. Okay, I've got another, uh, a couple of things that I want to cover with you, and then we'll make sure we have time for some questions. So how does this all play out? You've got a rapid decision-making loop. You've got all this growth hacking going on. You've got all these teams out there saying, hey, we should do this, we should do that. Where do all those ideas go? Um, the existing budgeting processes don't work because they're annual um, and they encourage inc incrementalism. Often existing structures create win-lose scenarios and risk to the existing core. You've got all kinds of human dynamics, you know, not in my backyard, I'm not going to help this because what's in it for me. You know, you're a publicly traded company, you're only as good as your last quarter. So one thing that I increasingly look for in organizations that I think are going to be okay on this front is where's the separate group? Where's the separate funding mechanism? Where's the um, assistance? You know, where's the protection from the internal corporate immune system uh, to give these ideas, sometimes seemingly crazy ideas, uh, a bit of breathing space? So we're all familiar with the Google Ventures of the world, the Salesforce, but everybody's starting to do it. You've got Walmart, uh, you've got 7-Eleven, you've got people, Starbucks is not on here, but you've got all kinds of different organizations that are basically creating these internal incubators, accelerators, or they're partnering with other entities um, uh, that are, are geographically based, Mars in Toronto, for example. Um, to basically make sure that they don't miss the boat and uh, they get some insight, some experience, some capabilities and some skills so that they can make any number of choices to bring them back in. Um, and back to the class that I was teaching this morning, uh, which was even the old way of thinking about an industry. Um, all you have to do is look at what's happening in the automotive sector to look at the interconnections and um, and what these companies are, are thinking of doing. So this is the latest one I came uh, across, which is called Turo.com. This is basically Airbnb for your own car. So uh, talk about defraying the costs of, uh, of car ownership, should you be one of those car owners going forward. But to just give you some idea of all the cool stuff that's happening. All right, my last slide for you, and then we'll make sure we got 10 minutes for Q&A. So if I could only spend one minute and one slide basically saying, um, you know, what I hope you take away from this. If your organization is not hungry for really, truly new and different what's happening in our world, that's a huge problem. Um, if you think your industry is not being disrupted, please email me and let me know because I'm really hard pressed to find one that uh, I couldn't make the case that um, needs to be paying attention. Speaking of which, there's a ton, a ton of information out there, and I know we have many of our colleagues from, uh, from Deloitte on the call here, and uh, you guys have great, great data as well um, as everybody else. So pay attention, figure out who's doing what. 
um, and make sure that you sort of just don't look at the stat, but, but ask the next question. This is where the small groups come in. Being nimble is all about um, establishing those guardrails and broad directionality, making some moves, and um, being really quick in understanding what's working, what's not working, and that, that rapid cycle time, I would argue, is a huge edge going forward. All right, I believe that is my very last slide. And uh, I know we've got a ton of questions, um, so let me uh, start to get to them. And a great one, how long should we wait to measure a strategy change is successful or not? That is a, that is a great question. And I've got um, two things to consider. It is very difficult to see total outcomes. Um, how will you ever know, except in hindsight, that the investment in Lyft that GM has made is actually going to pay off? Um, you're going to have to wait until the dust settles. So what do you do in the interim? You are looking for markers and proxies for the fact that something is working. So those proxies are everything from um, how many times, you know, customer feedback, not the quantitative N of 10,000 survey, um, but, you know, a group of, of influential, knowledgeable people who would say, yeah, yeah, I think it's working. How many people are attracted to work on a project, for example? Um, so you can think of sort of the crowd sourcing aspect or the wisdom of crowds. Um, sometimes you can establish a time frame over which uh, you will, um, you know, say, look, if, if I don't have certain revenues by a certain period of time, you know, we're going to drop it. But that's really tricky because sometimes it takes a while to figure out where the real gems are. So I'll answer the question more directly with advice that I give to entrepreneurs. Um, surround yourself with key advisors who have seen the movie before uh, in terms of what you're doing and, um, and, and whether or not something is working. And uh, I hope I am answering this question here. And if they tell you that the horse is dead, you dismount. But without establishing um, that group of trusted people, it becomes very difficult to pay attention, it becomes very difficult to pay attention to people who may lack credibility. So I don't know if I'm answering your question, but, but um, this is not about scorecards. This is not about necessarily hitting revenue targets um, at a certain stage. Uh, this is about a, a softer set of is it working, yes or no. I would direct you to a great book um, written, um, it's a stage gate book blanking on the guy's name from McMaster. It's a great, um, great, um, Bob Cooper is his name, Robert Cooper. Um, there's just some, some great insight into how you measure whether something's moving through a, a funnel um, long before you see the, the revenue. So, okay, we have uh, another question here. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, how do you create a culture with which welcomes change, and do you change the strategy and plan for culture to catch up? Uh, so great question. Again, um, a whole separate topic in and of itself. There are many reasons why people don't embrace change. So um, my first piece of advice is you need to, need to do some employee segmentation and understand um, what people are concerned about. Uh, Sometimes they just want to see leadership. Sometimes they want to know they're still going to have a job. Sometimes they want data. Sometimes they want to see that uh, you're really serious or that there is a way out. Um, you know, you're a 30-year veteran of Ford, GM, or any of those companies. You've been making cars for a long time, and it's a unionized environment. Um, sharing information about uh, the fact that GM or Ford or Chrysler or whoever will be successful over the long haul because they're reinvesting in doing different stuff is probably not a bad place to start. So some combination of sharing information and getting to the, the heart of human concerns um, is a key. That little two-by-two two matrix I showed you is a great way. We developed that from work we did with uh, Paul Tellier when he was uh, running CN, which was a huge 
turnaround change activity. And he would argue that, um, that sharing information about what's really going on is a good place to start. Um, so the second part of the question is, do you change strategy and plan for culture to catch up? Um, they need to go hand in hand. Um, there are ways to change culture quickly uh, by focusing on behaviors, not about on developing values, et cetera, but forcing behavioral change so that people will creatively adopt the new approach. Um, and again, I apologize for the short answer on that, but man, I could go on and on on that front. And I'm sure we're all familiar with the great phrase, culture eats strategy for lunch every day. I would suggest that uh, in organizations for which you actually have to see uh, a change in culture, you need to change your strategy first um, and, uh, and be ruthless in terms of how you get people to behave in a different way. Not by jamming it down their throats, but by, by very quickly figuring out how you address concerns and what you're going to do about them. Okay, how do big organizations support employees who don't own strategy but must execute on it? So this is really an interesting question as well. If you're a really big company, uh, you have to think explicitly about involving employees who execute change in understanding the front end part of why change, a change in strategy or even execution against an existing strategy, what that actually looks like in practical terms. So I alluded to something called growth hacking. Um, this is a great, uh, or just even hackathons, this is a great opportunity to engage people across an organization when you're at the cool face or the execution end in understanding what the changes are and why they need to be made. Um, what we do know in terms of implementation is that if you, these days, if you don't understand the why, it's really hard to do a great job in executing the how. Um, so the short answer is having five people involved in the strategy discussion is not the way to go. Many more opportunities for involvement pay dividends and being able to make it happen. Okay, so interesting. Um, next question is, how do you keep the current team engaged knowing another team is busy making the future? Apple famously created an internal war when a team split off to have to build the Macintosh. Um, so uh, there is a perception always that you're a second class citizen if you're keeping the lights on and doors open while somebody else is doing the new and nifty. So the best way I've seen this handled is that in describing the two elements of overall success in an organization, that keeping the lights on and doors open is as important as grow, build, and change. And this, the short answer to this is this is a leadership uh, question. And famously for me was a group I worked with where we were presenting the brave you know, the fantastic new strategy, all the new and cool stuff. And a woman who ran a call center put her hand up and said, wow, I don't see myself in any of that stuff. Don't I matter? And um, the uh, senior exec at the time said, you matter as much as anybody else, and here's why. So what uh, she eventually did in this case was that every, at every strategy update and communications and small group discussions. Um, she took great pains to actually highlight all the people who were keeping the business running. So the other way to think about this too is, uh, yes, you split people off into these separate teams, but anyone can be part of those teams. And depending on what the activity is that's being worked on, having that more fluid, um, ability for people to move across different parts of the organization is, uh, is a key here. And again, um, famously, although they did a number of things very badly with Enron, and uh, one of the things they did well was they basically had an internal market for talent. So if you wanted to go and work on new and cool stuff, um, your salary and your title went with you, but you got to work on a new project. And if, then if it didn't work out, you, gotta go, you uh, were able to go back into the organization. So that created great passion and enthusiasm for both, uh, both sides of the business. 
All right, I think we have, uh, do we have time for one more? So uh, this is, uh, any recommendations for fostering an agile culture in a volunteer intense organization? I actually think it's easier to do it in a volunteer intense organization because people are there for different reasons. So they want to contribute, they want to make a difference. So the, um, you know, the principles of the, the Agile Manifesto, um, in a way, are, um, are even more germane to people who, uh, who are there for other reasons. So the people over processes, the, um, you know, getting feedback kind of from the customer uh, end of things, all of those things resonate with the, uh, with people who are there to solve either social problems or, or associations, um, you name it. I'm just actually looking through my notes to uh, yeah, respond to change rather than follow a plan, um, you know, trying stuff uh, over excessive documentation. You know, you're a volunteer, that's a lot. You, you have a higher tolerance for risk than a lot of other people. Um, so that would be my answer to that. All right, uh, that's all the time we have, folks. Uh, I hope I've given you some food for thought. I love doing these webinars uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, as I feel on each slide, I could go into so much more detail. So um, please uh, enjoy the content. And if you're interested uh, in more, um, you know, look at, uh, at some of the references that I've alluded to. And uh, I'm going to sign off. Thank you so much for attending. It's been great to have you, and uh, enjoy the rest of the day.